Welcome to the Center for International and Regional Studies at Georgetown University in Qatar. This podcast series is part of the Energy Humanities Research Initiative. The project aims to generate new scholarly conversations on everyday lived experiences of energy. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Everyday Energy. I'm Trish Kajla, a historian at Georgetown University in Qatar. This episode is part of our second cluster of podcasts, examining artistic and literary representations of oil. In this episode, I'm joined by Victor Hikmanor, a Nigerian artist, writer, and photographer. We've split up our conversation into two episodes. In this episode, part one, we discuss the Hikmanor's The Wealth of Nations, an installation that offers a complex and multi-layered exploration of oil and politics in Nigeria. Part two continues the conversation, thinking about the wider implications of his work and what scholars, artists, and other practitioners in other national contexts should learn from the Nigerian experience. Right, so I thought we would just begin by briefly discussing your installation, The Wealth of Nations, to help give our listeners a sense of what it's like to experience your work. And so I was wondering if you would maybe walk us through how you would like um, visitors to sort of interact or see uh, the installation. I haven't myself had the chance to see it in person. I've only encountered it (laughs) through the internet. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Trish. The Wealth of Nation was uh, first installed. I mean, it has has traveled with different iterations, you know, so to two other locations. But that this particular one where the first one was um, installed was in Indonesia, Georgia, during the uh, Biennale, Georgia Biennale of 2015, I believe, you know, so it's, um, you know, it was, it was, there were like 11 artists from Nigeria and I was one of them to have a conversation with Indonesian artists and a lot of it was based on natural resources and the use of natural resources on both, uh, on both countries, you know, so I think they were speaking from that side. Uh, looking at their own natural resources in regards to like maybe coal and stuff like that and my country as well because we we've been kind of um, for lack of better word mono economy which is based on oil um, I, 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 I wanted to react to that you know so from perspective of consumerism and what help build nations and, and things like that you know so I decided to do Wealth of Nations, you know, which is coming from the economics, you know, so there's a book, Wealth of Nations, of course, you know, so I was kind of like referencing that in a way, but in a visual, in a visual stance. Um, the particular one, I decided to have uh, drums. There were three drums, uh, which I, I sourced from them and decided to paint the entire room with uh, what you call black gold. So the background of it is yellow. Then I used the uh, I used black to paint on the iconography, paint my iconography on the walls and on the floors as well. Kind of like an immersive installation. Um, then there is a water trough that is that is built to sit at the base of of the two of the three drums that are suspended from the ceiling inside the installation room, which is all enclosed. So what is that? What most people don't see is, uh, or what most people didn't experience with that installation was that there are three drums. You have two red drums on each side, which I also painted with uh, red and black, which shows the violent nature of what oil has been and the destructive nature of it. Uh, Then the middle one has the white, which, which referenced the British and the people that first discovered oil in commercial quantity in my country in 1956. February 1956 was when oil was first discovered in a place called Oloibiri, um, which, um, which, which has completely be really destroyed ecologically as we speak right now. So the water trough uh, was specifically created and made whereby it's lit, it has a light on it, and there's a spelling of Oloibiri, which is the first place, the first location where oil was discovered in my place in Nigeria. What happened is that I drilled a little bit of hole on the middle uh, uh, white drum and 
the remainder of the oil, they are all they are all empty barrels. But you know, like if it's not clean, you will still have a little bit of oil, you know, leftover oil. And the whole point of doing that was for people to see how long when an oil drop does be dripping in that water, where you write the oloibiri, how long will it take before you can no longer see that writing of the oloibiri and you can no longer see the light at all. So and that experiment took about 48 hours with the oil just dripping consistently on that water trough before the clean water completely became all mundled and all, all uh, polluted and uh, you couldn't see anything except like really this blood red, uh, really um, ugly looking flotation on top of the water, you know. So that, that was the most important part of it for me, just to even see how long. So you can imagine oil spillage has been going on in the Niger Delta in Nigeria. Oil spillage has been going on, particularly in Oloibiri, that really don't even have anything to show for uh, having the repository of where the wealth of nation, where the wealth of my country as, as a country, Nigeria, comes from. They don't have anything to show for it. The farming, the land, and everything has almost been wiped out. The people are as poor as you can as you can think. Whereby other 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 individuals have gotten really fat and rich on these uh, resources. So that was the point of that installation for me. And uh, since then, it has been reinstalled in uh, Dresden in Germany. But a different. I took a different stance on that one to commemorate people that have been environmental. Uh, activists to speak up about the degradation of environment in that area, uh, specifically with uh, Ken Sarawewa, who was uh, killed by the administration, by the Sani Abacha administration for speaking up against uh, uh, their land being destroyed, the Ogoni land, you know. So I had to use eight drums for that in Dresden. The eight drums no, actually nine drums. Nine drums represented the nine Ogoni men that were hung by the administration, you know. So uh, as you can see, it has kind of taken a different shape when I installed it in, uh, in, in when I installed it in, uh, in Dresden, then that moved to Poland uh, to be reinstalled as well in that sense, you know. So that, that is why you will have probably two installation or two iteration of uh, wealth of nation or going nine, you know, for the second uh, one that happened. So that is, that is pretty much it, you know. No, thank you so much. That's really evocative. I, I, what I'm really struck by is also just about, you know, when you were saying it takes 48 hours for the water to become obscured. Yeah. So when people were coming to visit it, did they tend to sort of see it in a moment and only catch a moment of how the, the water looked or were people revisiting it and seeing how it changed over time? Some people visited and watched how the water changed over time. There are people that come later on, that came later on that didn't know what it was before, which is what exactly I wanted. Because I mean, if you go there, you, you are not ever, you are you, you are not going to be able to know what happened to Loibiri. All you are going to see is the is the destruction. You are never going to be able to like know or see how the water looked when it was cleaned for fishermen up until 1956. So except for the people that were involved, except for those that are still alive that have seen, this is how all the farmers, the fishermen, who we know that, oh, our water used to be clean. We used to be able to swim in this water. We used to be able to fish. It was our livelihood, source of our livelihood. But something else was discovered that completely destroyed it. But for external visitors, for younger generations that are seeing only that, that is exactly what the installation spoke uh, to, you know, you understand. And that is my intention to realize that if you are present, you can see the, 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 the evolution of environmental evolution that occurred in that area. But if you are not present, you are going to meet something that is constantly and, uh, and, and, um, and definitely uh, repugnant to, to the site, you know. Yeah, I mean, this was actually uh, another question I had was about the barrels themselves. So I, I, yeah. I think I had mentioned I have a friend who works with coal ash, right, which is toxic. And I know oil also, right, is a very toxic material to work with. Yeah. Certainly, um, people in the Delta have had to deal with that in their lived experience. But I was wondering if there were any challenges with that, specifically about creating the installation or actually getting the barrels themselves. 
In Indonesia, no. Actually, um, I just requested because there's actually another one outside, which uh, so there were two installations, right? So there were another installation where I stack barrel up to about, I would say about eight meters high, like about about hundreds different barrels. That was the outside installation. Is the inside installation it was three big oil barriers that it wasn't it wasn't hard I, I requested it from the Biennale people and they were easy to get for me uh, and you know so that wasn't that wasn't a problem or even if you go to Nigeria to get oil barriers of that nature it's not a problem I mean they they are all over the place uh, in different you know so but yeah with the oil company names clearly stamped on them you know yeah, which is, you know, a really interesting way in the sense where it's, you know, it's very much rooted in place, right? And I think particularly the script is really evocative of that. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also a, a really planetary experience, right? Because it's not just Nigeria that has this experience with oil. It's no. spreads in different ways, but those barrels go everywhere. Exactly. So it can relate to them. People can relate to them. People know what it is. It's, it's very emblematic and symbolic of, of what it carries, you know, so... It said that oil itself or the byproduct of oil, uh, you know, yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. So another thing I had come across was um, sort of your initial introduction to the installation. And here you had talked about mirroring the discovery of oil, right, with the discovery of coup d'etat. And mm -hmm. I was really struck by that because, again, we're, we're used to the narrative of discovering oil, right? That's sort of, um, it's a, a set of words that conjures uh, a particular visual narrative, I think for people right with the gushing oil spurt and all sorts of things. Um, but I think that the idea of discovery of a coup is a little bit more unsettling, right? When you first encounter it, and it is really thought, it's a really thought provoking way of sort of getting people to think about the relationship between oil and the state. Um, and so I was wondering if you could say more about just that phrasing or how you arrived at it. There, there is more to it in my in my visual correlation of of, of coup and oil barriers as well you know so if you're familiar with the history of my country um you realize that when when i started growing up there were kind of like successive coup instead of having your four-year elections in the u.s we pretty much were waiting for coup to change you know so there were so much in the 80s and um i think it pretty much petered out a little bit in the 90s but throughout the 80s when i was a, a young person and a child um it was about coup for us you know so the ones that did not succeed the coup plotters that did not succeed were tied to sticks and the oil barrels were filled with sand behind them okay so <laughs> now you have to look at the relationship between using that oil barrel to catch the bullets when they are openly and uh, publicly executed, right? So when we see barrels being stacked together, that is the visual image that comes to a child's mind because they are all over on TV, they are newspapers and stuff like that. But we can roll that back a little bit as well to realize that why were people so interested in power? Because when they tested power, the oil was what was bringing the amount of money what they were actually fighting for was that resources to be able to have a control over that resources to be able to have access to that resources whereby most of the oil wells in my country are owned by i mean generals you know so it's really it's really correlative there is no difference between that cool i mean like you don't fight for nothing right you don't you don't you wouldn't want to like go into that kind of really do or die affair, which is a very cool, it's a very dangerous uh, endeavor to, to take power. It's not like, oh, you are campaigning in your district and you, you didn't get voted for, then you can go home and, and have dinner with your children. If you, if you fail, if your coup fails, you ain't going nowhere. You don't have dinner. That's your last meal, you know? But if you succeed, you realize that you have an enormous amount of power in your hands. You have access to the entire country's resources and you can do whatever you want to do with it you know so if you look at the oil trading and the oil you know uh, situation in my country you know like the oil wells belong to a lot of the military guys even if not directly but indirectly you know so there is no difference i, I mean I, I make that relationship between um, the oil barriers of my that my installation of wealth of nations and um, and and uh, and coups I, I, a lot of my upbringing was under military regimes, you understand? I, I have this weird fascination with cool speeches. I analyze them, I listen to them and stuff like that, you know? So 
Um, I, 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 I know definitely they are correlated. Yeah, and so it's a really just sort of even more than just that um, yeah. metaphorical connection. It's just a really material connection between connection, them. Yeah. Let's see, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I think the like I was saying that the barrel is sort of this obvious uh, encounter with oil that's you know legible to a global audience. Though I think certainly, right, more historical knowledge of Nigerian history is necessary to fully grasp the meaning of it. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, in particular, like as you would phrase it, right, the black gold on the walls, right, is a little bit, um, is, is not the kind of direct representation we often think of when we think of how oil looks when we encounter it mm -hmm. uh, in everyday life. And I think even your transformation of the barrels, right, really forces us to reconsider what they are as material objects. So um, can you speak a little bit more about, you know, we've talked a little bit about the barrels, you've described the room for us, um, but sort of how you arrived at this particular form for representing oil um, in Nigeria and particularly maybe about how it really, because I know some of the same script also appears in your other work as well. So how is it translating that into the into this particular installation? Um, I think, you know, you use what you have, right? To, 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 um, to express what you need to express. You as a historian, there are certain uh, words, there are certain pedagogical background that you have that you're gonna bring into analyzing. You can decide if you wanna look at world history, you wanna look at regional history, to look at your country's history and how it relates to the other. You're not gonna go in there as an ethno, uh, ethnographer, right? You're gonna go in there as a historian. So when I needed to approach uh, this, you know, when I know that, I'm not writing about it. I have to make a visual representation of it. Um, you know, you have to bring what you have. And my iconography is, um, is what I have, is what has been given to me over time. Uh, we have to realize also it was a form of communication. It was a form of writing that has gone extinct, you know. So how do you now take what was once textual to make it a visual communication? You know, so that language is still there for me to use. How do you use that language in a more robust way to draw people's attention to what you want to say? And what are those uh, totems that you have to bring to play with it? So it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it was a very conscious decision for me to make it a bit overwhelming. So like as if you're in the sea, you know, as if you're in, in deep water, what do you see? Can you really describe what you see. If you are not an oceanographer, when you go deep down in the sea, are you able to know what you see? Or you're just going to enjoy it as, as a form of nature, you know? So all those things go through my head when I'm deciding on what I'll use for certain installations or what I want to do with certain installations. But the fact that we call black gold and how do you represent gold? And, you know, yellow is the closest thing you can get to gold. And of course, black is there, you call it black gold. So I brought in all these uh, visual elements to, to create the, the, the work. And I chose what we also tied to me, what people will see and say, oh, I mean, I could have just put drums there and call it a day, you know, but I needed to also bring in my own self into it. I needed to bring my DNA into the work to make sure that people are attracted to it and people um, come close to it and be able to question what is going on there, you know? So it's almost like lighting, um, a lamp so that the moth can gather around it. Right, so the, what do you need to be able to actually see the thing that's in front of your face, right? So if you just put the barrels there, you won't see it, but now you exactly. can actually see. Yeah, so, yeah. so, I mean, I, I guess I'll just sort of jump ahead a little bit. And I, I mean, I'd love to hear more about, you know, particularly as you saw people encountering the installation or just the questions that you want people to leave with after encountering the installation. Oftentimes when you when you expose certain things like that, you know, except you are really like um, documenting the or doing a, you know, what what I probably call qualitative, quantitative analysis of the of the process, you know. So as an artist, I I do what I do and I move on and I have said what I've said. I mean, 15, you know, 2015 is what? That is seven years ago or there about now, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are. Revisiting, <laughs> revisiting it right now, and uh, and I'm um, having to even reflect on it seven years later to see certain things that I put in those places that I didn't 
kind of process as at the time, you know. So mm -hmm. it's very hard for me to say, okay, this is what I expect people to look at. But I know that the response was quite uh, immense and people were able to like kind of stare at it and look at it and read the text that came with it to realize, okay, and you know, people that didn't know about Nigerian oil or didn't know about Nigerian artists or something. They, so when people go into museums or go into installations or go to biennales or see a piece of work, they, they, they live with different ideas, you understand, you know, so the political scientists can come and see something political about it. The, the social scientists can come, the environmentalists can come. I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. You know, and the curator can come over like, oh, that's nice, you know. So yes, you probably could have moved this over. You know, so people are going to come with different sensibilities to um, to 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 a form of uh, art work, you know. So I'm just thinking about you know the United States, uh, whether it likes to think of itself this way or not, is an is an oil country. It's a fossil fuel country, and the second you begin to question the basis of those fuels, right, you call into question all of the myths the country tells itself about itself. But I can imagine that that operates really differently. The United States is an ongoing settler colony, right? It's ongoing, it has ongoing colonization, particularly in uh, the indigenous West. But, you know, oil in Nigeria, from my understanding, right, was also part of the, the promise of the post-colonial moment, right? And so how does the, the incredible, you know, personal, environmental, uh, emotional costs of oil production in the Delta, how has that, um, does I guess does Nigeria have a different kind of national mythology about oil? So it's interesting how um, that conversation always creates a great divide, right? Because you have the you have the oil on the southern part of the country, then of course you, the, my country is big. You understand what I'm saying, and the oil is coming from a certain part of the country, which is the Niger Delta, you know. So the conversation the Niger Delta, the typical Niger Delta person is having would be different from what the other part of the countries are having, right? So it can be unsettling. No matter how you want to look at it, it's like, hey, look, we want schools, we want environmental cleanup and all of that, right? It's always seen as if they're asking for something out of the ordinary, right? Or there's always, it, it, the conversations are never really very straightforward. It's always like we spoke about violence uh, earlier, but to the extent that even the words that I use, like, okay, please, you guys are polluting my, my area. I say, okay, so, you know, we'll clean it up, but we need, we, need to, we need to budget because that's where the money is coming from. So you sit somewhere first to figure it out and all of that, you understand, you know? So it's, it's no longer even a conversation that one is having with, say colonial masters or things like that. It's, it's an internal conversation that is very unsettling whenever those questions come up. Uh, and people tend to have, avoid it because it, it becomes a bit dangerous because it, it's where the money that runs the country is coming from. So when you are saying that, look, come and clean up the environment, we no longer have water to drink, we no longer have fish and all of those things, what voice are you using to say the, because the people are look the places where you have this oil and all of those things are quite local they are not developed it's almost like it's almost like you know i mean it's been treated like a, a, a toilet you even clean your toilet right because that's where you go and you know do stuff you know so but people even also clean up their toilet you know so so that they can reuse it but a situation where you don't you just keep taking and taking and taking then whenever the conversation of, okay, can we revisit this issue of what you are taking and how you are taking it and what is being left behind, they become very tempestuous, you understand? You know? So that is why the conversations, I would say, have really had very minimal results in the past or even in the present. And so and you had mentioned at one point that you haven't yet been able to install this in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, how do you think the, response or the engagement with the installation might be different than it has in um, a place like in Germany or Poland? The sad thing about my country when it comes to um, using art or writing to create an awareness or even push governments to do something is that over the years they have they have developed a very thick skin for these things they have 
they have seared their conscience to uh, art as a form of protest, right? So it's a matter of, it would, I, I don't think they will even pay attention to it. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there are countries where cartoons are still being respected, right? There are countries where if, if uh, for instance, maybe Washington Post were to like have an expose or a New York Times were to have an expose, you understand? There would be actions and reactions. But my country, it, 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 I mean, like, it, it's not like that, you know? So if I were to create that um, same installation, it's, it's not gonna make the, 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 it's not gonna make my country think twice, all right? So there is, except you now go and create that installation whereby it disturbs the pipelines, <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you go and create it whereby the oil is not flowing, then, you are ready for war, right? Then somebody is going to listen and it's not going to be a beautiful dance, right? Okay, so that is that. I mean, there's an artist in, uh, in Ogoni land, in, um, there's an artist from the Niger Delta, Sokari Douglas Camp, who is based in the UK, uh, created a work to speak to uh, the, the plight of the Ogoni people and also reference Kensaro Wewa and all of that. He created this, uh, uh, he also used barre and created like a big truck or something like that, which had a good, created a great awareness in UK when it was shown, but when it was being shipped to Nigeria, it got stuck in the, in the they, they seized it or it has never been able to be cleared in, 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 the, in the ports. So in that sense, it's like, okay, this one has an international traction. So guys, we're not going to clear this because we don't know what kind of other problem this is going to cause in the country. So in that sense, even if I install it, which eventually I may install one day, it's just to also create awareness for the people and everything. It's probably not going to ruffle any feather or, or create anything that will make them change their policies or even create awareness. If anything, it will create awareness for the private sectors, for the NGOs that are helping with the cleaning and all of that. It's not going to create a national... Uh, outcry and stuff like that you know so yeah yeah I mean it seems like people in the delta have had to make the outcry for themselves to the yes. extent that yeah. the issue gets attention yeah. yeah I don't think I could offer any better ending than that that was a really fantastic reflection thank you um, so <laughs> thank you so much again thank you Trish thank you so much